morning, everybody. Um, yeah, so my name is Levi, um, and I get the privilege of bringing um, the next chapter as we journey through the book of Nehemiah together as a church. And I um, just want to say hi to the people online tuning in. Uh, it's great to have you listening as well. I hope you've enjoyed the worship and everything else so far. Uh, so, as we look at Nehemiah, um, we've been journeying through a few things so far. Um, Nehemiah started out as a cupbearer. Well, that's where the book begins. And he's in captivity along with many of his fellow Israelites. And so he hears a report about how Jerusalem is going so far. Uh, there's been a few people being able to be released to go and kind of restore um, the kind of the city of Jerusalem and then I guess the, the nation surrounding that. But when he hears the report in chapter one, he hears that the walls are in disrepair. And this especially burdens Nehemiah. Uh, this is something that is um, a, a bit of a, a passion for him. Uh, so he goes to the king. Uh, he gets written permission to go back to Jerusalem with a whole lot of other people. And he's even worried about the people who he'll have to journey through the lands to get to Jerusalem opposing him. So he's actually got the king of Persia's written permission to go and do this. And... He's so far become a very effective leader in this task, you know, where it could have taken years to do this. There would have been, uh, you know, sections all in disrepair where the previous uh, empire had gone and stoned it down. Um, but he's come up with a plan where each person, each group of people nearest their section of the wall, they all focus on their part. And in 52 days so far, they have got everything complete apart from the walls, sorry, apart from the gates. So all the wall is now mended. So, so far, as we look into uh, chapter six, to this point, you could say Nehemiah is the right guy for the job. He's in the right place. He's doing the right thing. And he's got God's blessing on it. And so this guy is an amazing guy. But uh, as I read, just I'm going to read, Chapter 6, verse 1 to 9. And let's see kind of what happens at this point. So now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it at all, although up to this time I had not set up the doors and the gates, in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, come and let us meet together in Hakafirium in the plain of Ono, but they intended to do me harm. I sent messengers back to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should I stop the work while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered in the same manner. In the same way, Sanballat for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. This is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah, and now the king will hear of these reports. So you come down and let us take counsel together. Wow. So, so far, you've got Nehemiah doing exactly what he's called to do. And uh, these people, at first, they come with a bit of a distraction. You know, they come and they say, well, you're taking on this mighty work. Good for you. But, you know, you probably should come and talk to us and we can give you counsel on probably the best way to move forward in this tedious project. But Nehemiah sees it for what it is. He sees it as a distraction from what he's supposed to be doing. And in fact, he's got, he's got quite a lot of insight. And he says, you know, but they intended to do me harm. And so already he's picking up on something more sinister than what they're laying out at first. But then the fifth time really shows in the true light 
where they're coming from. And they've invented a threat. And so they're not just saying, oh, you know, come and like we can take advice, but they've weaved uh, a story out of nowhere to say, well, actually, hang on, you've been released by the king, but there's stories getting around and my friends have confirmed it that you're actually trying to make yourself king. Your mission isn't just to restore the wall, just to kind of get your people back together, but you're actually in this plan trying to become a king and you'll be rebelling against the one who's taken you into captivity still. And so if this, if this is true, if there are actually rumors going around, if that reached the king, this would actually be quite life-threatening for Nehemiah. This is something that is no light threat. And so when Nehemiah has to respond to this, you know, there's a lot at stake. But let's just see how Nehemiah does respond. So if you go to the next slide, please. So the first time, he replies out of a space of knowing exactly where he's supposed to be. And so he knew that what he knew that the temptation to go and do what they're asking went opposed exactly what he was there for. So he was like, I'm this, I'm doing this, I'm supposed to be there. Anything else will actually be less than what I'm supposed to be doing. But then when these threats came along, he discerned that they were threats, discerned that they were empty threats, and he did not let these false rumors concerning, concern him more than God's purpose for him. And so he had to completely trust God that what was being said about him wouldn't actually bring him to harm. And so, and then immediately after this, Nehemiah asked God for strength. And in doing so, he kept God at the center of his life. You know, he wasn't trying to do this in his own strength. He asked God to uphold him. So we may not be facing such blatant opposition today. I mean, who here is building a wall right now? And even if you are, who's opposed to it? Except, you know, what Nehemiah was going through was actually quite similar to a lot of the things that we may go through today. You know, when we're trying to walk in what God has for us, we'll come across difficulties uh, in walking for these, in these plans. So I'm just going to name a few of these uh, challenges that you may be facing today. Uh, I've gone through every single one of them and still go through these sort of, I guess, distractions, these temptations, these challenges that keep me from walking in what God has for me. I guess the first one is you may not actually know what God wants you to be doing right now. And it was all very well for Nehemiah to be going, well, I'm supposed to be building this wall. God's blessed me in this. And so anything else is obviously not supposed to be done by me. But, you know, a lot of you may be asking, well, what is God's plan for my life? How do I know what's a distraction and what's not? Another difficulty you may have is not having the ability to know how to respond to challenges. You know, when something comes up, do you see it as a sign from God? Are you able to distinguish something that God may be leading you in or what may be coming from the enemy or others who might want to uh, distract us? You know, how do you actually respond to challenges? It was very clear for Nehemiah to do what he did, but how do we know where to stand when these things happen? Some of you may be feeling like the need to control what others think of you is your greatest priority. You know, how does your reputation go? What are other people saying about you behind your back? Do you hear about it? And how concerned are you when they do come? Again, Nehemiah was such a great example of completely casting aside the concern that this was happening. He just called it a lie because he knew it was. And then he moved straight on with his business. It's not so easy for all of us to do that. And then lastly, some of us might be thinking that God wants to do what we're called to do in our own strength. You know, you may be thinking, well, gosh, I'm disappointing God all the time. I'm trying to do this thing for him. I know what he wants me to do, but 
I'm ashamed to come to God because I feel like I'm letting him down in this because I'm not where I should be or there's greater opposition than I thought there was going to be in this. And so these four things can be really challenging for us in when we're walking in our calling. But I think the main thing that I'd like for us to get uh, from this passage and in a moment when these people come and they bring their testimony of where they're walking through challenges or where they have come across difficulties or distractions from what they've been told to do by God or even just where they're living and the challenges are enough to just take them out whether they um, are truly, you know, even if they're aware of the impact they're going to have later. But in this last slide, I'd just like to sum it up by saying that when we walk in the calling that God has for us, we do not need to fear what others say against us. And so I'd like to invite our first um, person to give a testimony, Geordie Cranston. And after that, we'll hear from two others. Thank you, Jordan. Hey guys, how are you today? Um, so I'm going to be sharing a little bit of a testimony um, about how distraction has come about in my life. <laughs> Thanks for it. Um, so oops. in Nehemiah 6, we, he is faced with enemies um, who are trying to distract him from building the wall. And just like him, we are faced with distraction. Um, and distractions aren't always physical. They come in so many different forms and look different for everyone. One thing that I would say is a critical turning point of me choosing distraction over God um, was the end of 2021, start of 2022. Um, I like to call this distraction the rosy glasses of I can do this on my own and giving up on hope. At this point, I was going through a lot. I had recently started intense form of therapy called Schema that is used to help those with complex PTSD. This was revealing a lot of memories of abuse and trauma um, that my brain had literally blocked out of my mind. At the same time, my mum wasn't doing so well. We're at six months of, since her um, stage four cancer diagnosis and the unknown of how much longer did we have left with her on this earth. And this being extra hard because family, we, we had already lost that. It was really tough because there was a lot of questions coming up. Is God really good? because I felt like my life was just a big mess of nothing good. Is actually working through my trauma going to be beneficial for me? Um, and how could everything I've been through be helpful? And I had people keep telling me, God is going to use you in so many ways. You're going to help so many people. Don't give up. Life will get better. Miracles do happen. Don't give up hope. These things I was tired of hearing. I was a decade into mental health challenges. And at the point, I was at the point where the temptation of giving up was, and going down the complete opposite road was more like, sounded so much better. Um, I got tired of fighting and the enemy really got a good grip on me. Um, so I, where am I up to, sorry. Um, there. Um, I had decided that I, like I'd hit rock bottom. I'd given up on God. I had left the church. I cut ties with really good um, friends and communication with them. I didn't want anything to do with religion because how could there be God with everything I had been through? I had lost myself, completely disconnected from reality and wasn't able to see what damage was really happening. I was really distracted with these rosy glasses of I can do it on my own. I thought I was doing better than ever. Um, I th was like, I can't believe I hadn't dropped church and religion before because I was actually happy and the best I'd ever been. Um, I, um, cutting off the people that I did apparently was the best decision ever. And that's how I felt. And at the same time, mum was doing better and our relationship was actually got, gotten stronger. I had new friends. I'd moved out of home. I was living life to the fullest. Felt like nothing majorly bad was happening. And I made the right choice. I swear that I hadn't. The rosy glasses became dull eventually and around May 2022 and ended back up in a psychiatric hospital that I had been a frequent flyer to a few years prior. Here, God worked in mysterious ways, which is pretty crazy. 
my treating psychiatrist at the facility, who I saw twice a week, made the observation in our third session that I hadn't mentioned church. This was very unusual as I would write off the bat first thing before we even would talk about what brought me into hospital again, was I'd ask for leave to come to church or ask for exemption from group therapy so I could attend life group. I basically told him, oh yeah, that's because I'm not a Christian anymore. I don't go to church. He was shocked, but what came out of his mouth probably shocked me more. He told me he doesn't believe me and he won't allow me to continue that. Um, this was shocking because I'd been, he's been my treating psychiatrist for four years and we'd had many conversations on religion and he would keep telling me, I'm 100% an atheist and I don't believe in anything beyond our life. There's no higher power. So the fact that he told me that he didn't believe me was like, oh, okay. I was not expecting it. Um, so he basically told me, your homework is that you have to go to church. And I was like, mm, no, thank you. And he was like, if you don't want, if you want to be discharged, you have to go. And I was like, okay. And I knew he was being honest because he always is. And so I did come to church the first time only because I was really missing my dog, Jet, and I wanted to get back home to him. So I went to church, but I had a massive concrete wall around my heart. I really didn't want to come back, but I was in hospital for eight weeks and I had to go to church every Sunday. It, that was my treatment plan. And by the end, I started to realize how much the rosy distraction and the ease of giving up was actually quite awful. Just 12 months on since this was happening, and the massive concrete wall that was around my heart is actually completely gone. Um, but in saying that, it has not been an easy 12 months. It's probably been the hardest 12 months of my life. I, we lost mum in February. I personally have been diagnosed with multiple chronic illnesses that will most likely affect me for the rest of my life, including relying on a wheelchair and losing independence. And I'm still going through the scheme of therapy for my PTSD. But I have decided to ask God for strength and chosen not to come down from what I'm doing and saying I'm carrying on a great project and cannot come down. And I keep leaning on God and those he's put around me to help me build my wall. And I've actually been able, I can actually say that I'm better than ever. My mental health is, an outlook on life is so much better. I've been actually able to see firsthand how God is going to use me and able to help others thanks to the trials I have faced. And that life can and will get better even though it isn't the way you might think it would be. Is it easy? Absolutely not. But is it worth it? 100%. I would like to invite Ryan now. Morning. Not the Ryan you're expecting. <laughs> so, distractions. Well, I'm something of an expert on that. I get distracted very easy. Uh, whether it be um, I need to study for an assignment and instead I play games, or I need to lose weight and I go to McDonald's. <laughs> Most perhaps one of the biggest distractions in my life occurred when I finished school in 2017. I'm originally from WA, and back then my greatest desire was to join the army. I had spent my entire schooling career basically preparing myself to join the army. Physical training, uh, studying what my, what my potential training in the army would be, as well as potential roles in the army. Uh, it, it, my schooling career itself, I didn't actually do too well because I was so focused on this. Eventually, I um, uh, attended an induction course and, um, in order to apply for it. However, they said no. My, everything I'd prepared you up to this point had, no, sorry. Uh, I really didn't know what to do at this point because I had not prepared for them to say no. They said I had 12 months um, before I could reapply. And so I decided in this time, I was going to uh, attend TAFE and just do a small course, just basically to pass away the time. I did a Cert two in cabinet making and during this time, I actually was given a really good opportunity to start an apprenticeship with, the, um, with a small company. However, I said no because I was going to join the army. Uh, around this time, uh, my mom actually um, invited me to attend the Hillsong Conference in New South Wales. 
up until this point, my Christian walk had been a bit uh, rocky, to say the least. Um, for one reason or another, I figured, you know what, why not? So I booked a plane ticket and I was going to come to Sydney to attend the Hillsong Conference. However, around about this same time, I found an ad on YouTube. Now, this wasn't like a video ad on YouTube. This was just a pop-up ad on the side, which was for a spiritual healing course that was also going to be in New South Wales. So it was for a, um, a ministry and discipleship group called LL Ministries. And I figured, you know what, I'm going to New South Wales, so might as well just uh, attend this place and see what it's like. So I booked two uh, weekend courses uh, to attend this place around about like oh, the weekend before and after the Hillsong Conference. And so I jumped on a plane and went to New South Wales. Now, to say the least, this was a very intense spiritual week for me. Back-to-back uh, -back weekend courses of just learning about God and plus the Hillsong Conference, just a lot of uh, energy just there. It was really big um, for me, especially for a young Christian. However, at the same time, I was also a very shy person. Especially at the two weekend courses at Alel, I spent my entire time more or less hidden in a corner and trying to blend in. However, God wasn't having any of that. While I was there, another young man uh, noticed me and he decided to sit down with me on my last, uh, my last day there. And I had a pretty intense conversation with him. This conversation ended with me receiving a flyer for a low ministry year-long discipleship course for young adults. Now, coming off this week, I was fully prepared to be the good Christian and figured I would at attend this discipleship course. And this lasted about a week. After this um, point, my desire to join the army was starting to spring up again. And uh, the six months had passed, and I figured, you know what, I'm going to take these six months and again start preparing for my decision to uh, well, join the army. Now, um, so uh, the next six months sort of continue in this way, and it would have continued like that had God not intervened. My mum, for some reason or another, got in contact with the law ministries, and during that time, she uh, brought up my application, which I had not sent in. <laughs> she sort of uh, asked me about this, and through her, God um, more or less convinced me that uh, LL Ministries was the place for me. Now, this was in January of 2019. However, LL Ministries, uh, the discipleship course, had already started. Uh, it had been going, ongoing for a month, and I thought, you know what, they're probably not going to accept me because uh, they've been going for a month. Uh, I still put in my application, and they actually got back to me and said, yeah, sure, we'll be willing, which was a big surprise. I, now, um, just for a little extra context, this was on Mon the Monday of, uh, uh, on a Monday. Uh, on Tuesday, they got back to me, and so I then booked a video interview with um, some of the people there. And I was going to um, have this interview on the Wednesday, the next day. I figured at this point, you know what, if I just sort of, you know, say I'm not that good a person or, you know, just try and like downplay my uh, Christianity, they'll probably say no and I'll then get to continue, you know, with my planned course. <laughs> For some reason, they still accepted me. <laughs> they told me that they'll normally get back to, to people in 24 hours or so with um, their decision. They got back to me in three. That night, I got on a plane and arrived in Sydney on Thursday and spent the full day just sleeping and trying to get over my jet lag. On Friday, I started at Alel. I stayed at Alel for two years. Uh, it was one of the best decisions I've ever made. Uh, at Alel, I grew spiritually and I grew mentally, just maturing in a way I probably never would have if I'd gone to the army. If I had to make that choice again, I think I would uh, go down the path God had set for me rather than being distracted. I'd now like to invite up Elise to wrap us up. Thanks, Ryan. We've accidentally got a bit of an LL plug here tonight, today. <laughs> um, 
Hey guys, I'll just start off with a quick introduction. My name is Elise, I'm 21, and I'm currently an undivided student at LL Ministries. Same program Ryan was just talking about. Undivided is a year of discipleship and training, which is helping me pursue a deeper relationship with God. To share just a little of my backstory, I grew up in quite a broken home. I've never met my dad, and I have a very difficult relationship with my mum. I had some very challenging teenage years, but somehow by God's grace, I ended up at LL. My missional goal this year is to grow a deeper, more intimate relationship with my Heavenly Father. It is to grow more Christ-like in character and learn to be fully dependent on God. It is to be more passionate and on fire for Him. My end goal is to love both God and others better. This undivided year is really challenging though, and it is forcing me to look at who I really am. It is so easy to run and hide out of fear and shame as who I really am is being exposed. There are so many distractions that are constantly trying to draw my focus and attention away from God and that hinder my discipleship journey. My biggest distraction is probably myself and my own sinful nature. My flesh desires and is tempted by sin and old behavior patterns that I naturally first want to turn to. This for me has been Netflix, sad, depressing music, comfort eating and idolizing other people. If I don't, oh yeah, sorry. I try to find comfort anywhere else apart from God. And I block out, yeah, I also block God out and ignore him. If I don't let him talk to me, he can't say anything to challenge me. And I can continue living out of my flesh. The enemy is also very deceptive and distracting. He attacks me with lies and fills me with self-doubt of if I am actually capable of this journey. I am slightly quicker now to recognize the enemy's distractions, but it is a struggle to believe and stand on God's truth. The enemy tries everything he can to stop my pursuit of God and the outworking of my mission. All of these distractions come at a cost, though, to my relationship with God and my mission to be closer to him. I often feel more distant from him and begin believing that he isn't good or doesn't care about me. I am more easily swayed by my thoughts and emotions. I start struggling more with my depression and anxiety. I sometimes even start to blame God when my life seems to be falling apart. But in reality, though, it it has been my decisions, whether watching Netflix or finding comfort in food instead of him, that moves me further away. Whenever I choose to pursue something that isn't God, I am actively saying no to him and I'm not prioritizing my mission and I'm not fully depending on him. Just to give an example actually from even just a week ago, I was having quite a rough week and was feeling very depressed and low. I listened to lots of sad music and dwelled on the negative thoughts going through my head. The very first thing I stopped doing was my morning devotions and spending time with God. I was distracted and it resulted in me distancing myself from him. The calling, God on, on, the calling God has on my life is unfolding every day. I don't know exactly what the purpose and calling for my life is yet, but I do know that there will always be distractions that will be trying to steer me away from what God has for me. As hard as this year is, I am slowly receiving inner healing, and I'm learning how to overcome these distractions so I can be better obedient to what he is calling me to, and so that I can live my life overflowing from a close relationship with my Heavenly Father. Okay, as I wrap up, I'm just going to pray for you guys now, if you just want to bow your heads. Dad, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for this opportunity for the young adults to come up here and share their hearts and their lives. You know, I just ask that you would make your presence known to everyone in this room and that you would be walking closely alongside each and every one of us as we are doing the mission that you have called us to. And I ask that you just continuously draw our attention to you and so that we wouldn't be so easily distracted by all the things that this world tries to throw at us. In Jesus' name, amen. (laughs) Wow, church, look what God is doing, huh? How good has today been? Come on, how good has today been? You guys have done a wonderful job. I don't think Matt was the only one needing a tissue box before because I just want to say as a church, we are so proud of our youth and our young adults. So proud. So proud of the way that you guys have ushered people through the car park, that you have stood on the stage and led worship, that you've preached with honesty and vulnerability. You guys are just amazing. And we can't wait to see what God is going to do in the days and the weeks and the months that are ahead. And church, I just want to cast your mind back just two years ago Because only just two years ago, we were looking around going, where are our youth? Where are the young adults? 
We were looking to put a youth pastor in place. We're looking to start a youth ministry from scratch. And now look at what is happening. I can only imagine what's going to, what it's going to look like in two more years' time as these guys flourish and they continue to minister to the generation below them. So can I just say, I want to continue to be a church that values the next generation. We want to keep cheering these guys on, investing in them, because they are the future, not just of our church, but of the kingdom, of what God wants to do on this earth. And so when you invest into them, you are investing into the future of the kingdom.